Sego, Zeguego. Welcome to Ongualuasu'a, which means our matters. Thanks for joining us for the next 30 minutes as we share with you information, updates, and stories from the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe's divisions and programs. We're very pleased to provide you with all the work being done to help build a better tomorrow. I'm your host, Brendan White. Now let's get started. The development of broadband has brought superior technology to the community of Akwazasne and in the process, many opportunities. Broadband Program Director and St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Chiefs provide details on how broadband has helped the community. Take a look. So here we have our broadband office building. Um, this building was built on a federal grant we received. Let's actually take a walk to our central office over here. I'm going to show you how everything works. So this is actually our central office. This is where the brains of the operations happen. Everything that makes the broadband systems work is located in this brown building over here. We have our video signal dishes that brings in our content for our video. And we have our tower, which is going to be a mixed use of wireless, provide services outside the reservation. It will be providing services for Bombay, Brazier, um, Fort Covington. We will, we will also be uh, leasing space on a tower to Verizon and AT&T at some point. Our tower is also used for bringing in local off-air channels. So we pick up channels from Canada. Uh, we pick up all our local affiliates and we also broadcast our local Aquasasa TV channel from there. One of our plans is we're gonna make this building a green friendly building. So we're going to fully automate the building with green technologies, gigabit speeds, auto, uh, automated systems, uh, home automation. Um, everything is going to be very high tech in this building. So to give you an idea of what has to happen over here, um, follow me. So there's a fiber optic splice enclosure. Um, from there, we have a fiber optic cable that goes aerial. If you follow all the way down to the next pole line right there and from there we go underground and there's an underground conduit that goes to the customer's premise um, device that's located on the side of the house which we'll go and take a look at next. So if you remember the orange conduit we looked at uh, coming down the pole line, um, that conduit runs all the way and this is where it terminates right here. Inside that orange conduit is a two count drop fiber. That fiber optic cable then goes into this uh, outdoor enclosure which is where we install all our electronics. Um, this is ultimately what it is that it provides all the bandwidth and internet and phone services that's required for this house and that's run throughout the whole um, territory. This is actually one strand of fiber optic cable. It's the size of your here and it can, has, it can handle 10, 20, 100 gigabits of data. There's many steps involved before you can actually get the broadband services. Um, I'm the field technician, so I come out and survey the home and determine whether it's aerial or underground and where we need to get this box right here on the home and active. So this one is was surveyed and it was determined the underground drop. So we came here, dug the trench and put the conduit in 18 inches underground and then pull the fiber. Okay, so this customer is just taking video services only, but they are, are today and they already have internet services. So the internet is already running right now and our technician just installed the coax cable today. So the coax plugs directly into here, comes down, gets grounded in case of any power surges or anything like that, it doesn't damage the equipment. So then it comes through here and two new cables are gonna go that way to the TVs the customer requested. Can you tell me why you chose um, broadband um, uh, over the services that you currently have? Well, I think it's good to uh, really 
test and see what you guys have to offer. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be one of the first ones to, to try it out and uh, see how it goes. Um, I have DirecTV currently and I'm um, just going to try and push them out the door and, and use a, a local business. Can you start, talk a little bit about the cost savings you have from taking our services compared to what you're currently paying with DirecTV? Yeah, I, I took a look at the packages and compared the, the stations of what we're going to get and it's it really is closely comparable to what I have for my current package and by switching to broadband services with um, the, it's going to be about a 50% savings and cut my bill pretty much in half. Wow, that's awesome. How do you think the community feels about the services that we are currently offering as far as internet and phone and the TV services? I think there's a lot of uh, buzz out there for it. Uh, people have been asking me about it, so I wanted to jump in and, and test, test it out. So I signed up uh, as soon as uh, I heard you guys were uh, connecting people and uh, so I'm going to be able to share that experience and tell everybody how the picture is and tell them about the, the services and or the TV stations and everything and and really had to convince my kids too that mm -hmm. switching over was not going to affect them because they had certain stations that they really like to watch and you know when they saw that what we're getting is, is, is comparable then they were they were on board. Then once we switched to broadband, it was just amazing the the speed that downloads were happening and yeah. and being able to uh, watch a movie without having to for it to buffer. I think it's improved a great deal because it, it uh, offers um, options that were that weren't there before. Everything that's accessible and seems to me like a metropolitan area is now accessible here. So if you have the inclination to, to conduct your business in that way, um, then um, you, can, you can do so. There's no limitations on it. I think that broadband has to expand beyond uh, our territory, the boundaries of our territory and, and into uh, the surrounding areas. I think that was probably the, um, uh, I think that was the intent behind uh, getting the grant was uh, to extend, uh, to, become, to become a player in the industry uh, in that regard and to have that be a revenue generator uh, for the territory. Uh, so I think it necessitates us moving off territory and, and uh, entering other markets that we hadn't really um, contemplated entering before. The construction of the Travis Sala Memorial Lacrosse Box was a special community project initiated by the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe. It began in response to a question Travis once asked, what are you doing for the children of Akwazasne? Well, that was the beginning. Let's take a look at how it has finally come to fruition. Uh, Travis Solomon uh, was an employee within our construction department uh, for many years here at the tribe. Uh, he was a very uh, integral piece to getting the park here started. Uh, he really challenged tribal council many years ago to develop this property uh, for the benefit of the youth. He came to me one day and was really, he was kind of mad and he said, the tribe doesn't do anything for our kids and lo and behold we started the um, the soccer field and then we built the playground and then Travis got sick and he had ALS which is more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease and one of the things that we had talked about was um, you know in the future when we did something like really amazing that we were going to do something more for Travis and his, the vision that he had for the kids from Akwesasne um, and then uh, Jalessa Barrero approached council about putting up the lacrosse box. In the fall of 2013, uh, we had approached uh, the Tribal Council about the idea of putting this box up for the kids in the community. We had identified at that time, uh, around September of that year, that we had additional funds uh, in the budget that weren't going to be spent out. So we said, what can we do with these funds uh, to benefit the community? Council got behind the idea very quickly. It was finished uh, that fall and into 2014. Uh, the boards were put up. Uh, additionally, uh, that year it was dedicated uh, at a community event uh, right here at the park. We named it the Travis Solomon Memorial Lacrosse Box. And if it wasn't for his vision and him being angry, <laughs> uh, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have this. He 
held lacrosse very close to his heart. It was a big part of his identity, as it is for the identity of all of our people. And so we thought it was appropriate to honor him in that way. Um, and so we did. And council was behind that. And the staff who had worked with him before he passed was behind that. His family was behind that. And so we were very uh, honored and, and happy to be able to do that for him and his family in recognition of what he had pushed and what had been accomplished with his efforts uh, for the kids in our community. So he's been a part of my life for, or he was a part of my life for quite a few years. And he's one of the reasons I got into hockey. He was a great force in finding the equipment, getting me signed up, taking me to practices, taking me to games. And even though I was an awful hockey player at first, he stuck with me and him and my mother shuttled me to all my games and all my practices. Even when I got into lacrosse um, my senior year at Salmon, I signed up for the Salmon River Boys team and I had never played lacrosse before. And he was real happy about it because he was a great lacrosse player and a big advocate. So when I got signed up, he helped find me equipment again. He got me a couple sticks to start off with. It really tied in nicely that later on they started the Generations Park and all the fields and the boxes and the walking trail and it was nice that they decided to add on um, a box and then having the community come together to volunteer their time to get the roof uh, put over it so that the kids and anybody else who comes here that they can play no matter what the weather's like and I'm sure he'd be really proud and happy that it's made it this far. I did the boy was one of the first people to inspire me to play lacrosse and he was also one of the people who started the walking trail, the fields and the playground. Yeah, he, he was really special to me. We would always We had always anticipated uh, a second phase being a roof um, itself for the box so that it could be used longer uh, earlier in the season, longer in the fall, um, help out in the winter time to keep the snow off uh, for the ice. And so uh, we've been very fortunate uh, to have some great partners uh, for the second phase. Uh, we've had great support from a local business um, and local entrepreneur, uh, Carrie Terrance, who has generously donated funds uh, for the uh, for the footers of the steel and also has purchased half of the cost of the steel roof as well. The Tribal Council uh, purchased the other half of the steel roof and then of course the labor to erect the steel and to put the roof together uh, is being very generously donated by our local union 440, uh, Mohawk Iron Workers who are really happy to have uh, donated their time and are donating their time uh, for their own grandkids, for their kids, for their community. On each episode of Ngwalwa Sun'a, we will highlight one tribal program. Today, we're taking a look at the tribe's health services and how it plays an integral role in Akwazasti. I, I define my job as, as, as director of this program as, as helping our staff do their function, their jobs. And, and my job is to be that liaison with, with uh, the leadership and, and with the community and, and to be that buffer between the two that if the community has concerns then, then I address them and vice versa. If the staff has issues, um, you know, I, I will uh, certainly get involved and help them. The flu clinic is, is, have started. They are available and our, our medical folks will, will impress upon everybody to get a flu shot. It's, it's imperative. Um, from, from an internal standpoint, we require it. And, and working in this building or any of our buildings where there's contact with our clients, it is required to get a flu shot. Hi, I'm Teresa Gardner. I'm a family nurse practitioner here at the clinic. I've worked here 26 years and um, I work in the outreach department now doing community health. Flu season is, comes once a year, as we all know. Everybody dreads getting the flu. So my department, we work very hard to get people immunized. So that means that you come in, you get a flu shot, 
and that should cover you from September until April, which is flu season. Um, it takes two weeks for the vaccine to actually be effective for people to have complete immunity. And um, after that, people still may, they could possibly get the flu, but it would be a much milder case. And in most people's instances, you would, there would be no uh, flu happening to them. Yes, um, we do immunize children from six months of age up until whatever age, you know. But our clinics only do ages three through the elderly population. So if you're under three years of age, we ask you to come to the, to the clinic here and see the pediatrician. Hand washing. Anybody who knows me always knows that I tell them, wash your hands. Cover your cough. People, you're, you're supposed to cough into your elbow is the proposed way. Um, as you enter the health facility, or I'm sure the tribal building, there are hand sanitizers. Please use the hand sanitizers upon entering the building and upon leaving the building. Um, we have a new feature with our health facility this year, um, or this month actually, that is called personal health record. Um, our personal health record is gonna be a, a, a feature that a patient will be able to go online via the internet and access their own records. Um, it's given the, the um, patients um, the responsibility to take care of their own health information, uh, whether it be uh, medications, um, immunizations, uh, lab results, problems, um, a multitude of, of data that they could have access to to help better serve themselves no matter where they are. All a person needs uh, is internet access via their computers at home, tablets, um, even their cell phone they can access. This is a national initiative that's, that's going on already all over the country. Um, Indian Health Services has just getting it going now in October um, and it's going to create a better communication between the providers and the patients to, to better help take care of themselves. The ABE Awards was created by the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe's Office for Economic Development to recognize local businesses that stand out in the community. Let's take a look at that story. On behalf of the Office of the Chamber of Commerce, I want to welcome you to this tremendous event where we celebrate our local businesses. The Chamber is about to celebrate two years of service. And our purpose is to have a strong working relationship amongst our businesses to build a better economy for our future generations. Our mission as the Office of the Chamber of Commerce is to promote and offers us a common sorry, economy with equality, unity, and opportunity to assist in launching development and maintenance of a small business within Akwesasne. Nomination form digitally, and this allowed our community members to go right online and enter in their name and everything like that and who they nominated as their favorite business. And this allowed everyone to have a chance to just let us know what it is that they like about the company, what they like about the business, and all of those um, nominations were gathered together at the end of July. After the nominations were all submitted, the committee that was um, of all our organizational representatives was so that all of the nominations remained neutral. And then in August, the voting began. So we compiled or created a uh, voting mechanism using fluid surveys, and that allowed the community to go right online, click on the links, vote for your favorite business, and this is where we were at. By the time the nominations were completed, we broke 2,000 votes for this event tonight. When the results were in, we got to work on finalizing the plan of what you see here tonight. It was amazing to see how many nominees, especially in the Business Women of the Year, we had 20 written nominations. Our voting period also saw over 2,000 votes, showed us that community was significantly involved in choosing the winners here tonight. Now, let's get on to the awards. And the first ever Abbey Award goes to Truck Stop Number 9. Duty 
the Abbey for Young Entrepreneur goes to Anne Mitchell. And the Abbey for the Business Women of the Year goes to Doreen Mitchell. And, and the, the Abbey, Abbey for customer, customer service goes to Three Feathers Cafe. <laughs> there it is. An award goes to Casey Swamp. <laughs> the Abbey for Community Choice Award goes to Aquasasne Mini Mart. And the Abbey for, for Arts and Business, and business goes, goes to Jordan Thompson. Thompson. The Abbey for Entrepreneur of the Year goes to Carrie Terrance. Keep in mind, everyone, people do exist without business, but business does not exist without people. So the Akwesasne businesses, thank you for growing and inspiring, and to the citizens of Akwesasne and the community, thank you so much for supporting. The administration team at the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe is working diligently for the community. Executive Director Jaleso Brero brings us up to date on what's happening with community infrastructure. We have over 220 tribal programs delivering essential services to the community on a daily basis. Uh, one of the big things we're going through at this time is our annual budgeting cycle. So that's when all of the tribal programs and the tribal divisions uh, come before our budget team to work through their 2016 uh, work plans for their programs. How they're going to deliver the services, what kind of fiscal resources they need to deliver those services. Uh, so we're almost done that process. Uh, our goal is to bring a balanced budget to Tribal Council for their eventual approval. The process we follow is governed by the 2013 Procedures Act, which mandates uh, that there is a community consultation for transparency. So that uh, draft budget will be presented to the community November 16th at 5 p.m. here in the community building lobby. At that time, community members will come and have an opportunity to review the draft budget, ask questions, and provide comment. Uh, there's a 15-day comment period open to the public where council and tribal administration will receive feedback and comment on the draft budget. Eventually, in December, tribal council will sign in the 2016 uh, St. Regis Mohawk Tribe operational budget. Uh, those funds will then be available for programs starting in January uh, to do the work that they need to do. It's been a very busy year for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe with respect to infrastructure development. We have several projects that have been completed this year that we're very proud of, uh, especially the addition to the family support building uh, here right across the driveway from the community building. Uh, this is a building where uh, essential programming for developmentally disabled uh, youth and adults takes place. Additionally, we are completing uh, this fall a new IRA home for developmentally disabled community members, and that's in Frogtown. So we're very proud to have a new home for six of our clients uh, residing there, which is really great for them. Uh, brings them from the Fort Covington facility on the territory, closer for their families to visit, and so we're really uh, proud of that. We have completed other projects, uh, such as the new entranceway to the Akwesasne Housing Authority property. Uh, we've received a lot of positive feedback about that, and we're also very proud to see that take place for the safety of our elders who reside uh, in those apartments there, and the programs and staff we utilize uh, that space as well. Uh, as everyone uh, sees, uh, one of the biggest projects in the community uh, is the lacrosse box roof at the park. Uh, that's another one uh, that's uh, completed this fall and we'll see more improvements to that facility and the park in general um, in the coming years. So we're really excited about that. Into the future, uh, we have several infrastructure development projects taking place. We have uh, in 16, we have a water line uh, replacement scheduled from the police station through Roosevelt Town. We've identified that there have been many water line ruptures in that stretch and to preserve the uh, operations of the tribal clinic 
of the tribal administration building here and other tribal facilities in that line and the homes and the businesses as well, we needed to replace that. So that's scheduled to be completed uh, in 2016. So there'll be some construction taking place there. One of the biggest projects we have coming up is our new tribal administration building. That's going to be located behind the walking trail at Generations Park. Uh, this is going to be a huge endeavor, uh, breaking ground in 2016 for a much needed uh, new administration building. One that's safer for the staff, safer for the community members, actually has an elevator and is ADA compliant so that our staff and our community can feel proud and feel safe in their work environment. Uh, that's about a two to three year process, um, but we will be breaking ground next year and we're very excited about that. The congestion at the tribal building is a very big concern to us. Um, a lot of near-miss accidents, congestion with parking, so this will address some of those concerns. And continued infrastructure development is critical to our tribe so that we can deliver uh, top-notch services. We need the adequate physical space to be able to do that. So from an infrastructure perspective, uh, we have a lot planned, uh, a lot on the table uh, coming forward. Tribal Council works on many issues. Tribal Chief Beverly Cook is an advocate for community health. In this segment, she discusses how Council overcomes adversity and builds resiliency in the community. Today, I wanted to talk about um, how I feel about adversity, how Native people um, face adversity every day. We received training back in 2012 on um, sexual assault. I trained to become a, a sexual assault nurse examiner. And part of the required reading in the training was about an adverse childhood experiences study that had been conducted in the 90s. <clears throat> it validated everything that I felt about where our, our ill health came from in terms of facing childhood adversity. Uh, people don't like to talk about it and it's a really sensitive subject, but to me, we have to address it. One of the things that doesn't get covered very often or doesn't get thought about very often is the biological, physiological changes that happen to a child when they are abused or neglected or live in a violent environment. That there's changes that happen to the genes, but also changes that happen in the way their nervous system grows. Because they're little, their nervous systems are growing from the time they're born till they're uh, young adults. Also, their nervous systems and the way that their bodies form themselves inside of the womb are also very important. So when I look at that, when I read the ACE study, when I looked at all the information that we've learned since then, all the research and all the science, it becomes, to me, it's imperative that we address those issues early on. So what does that mean? That means that we try to educate parents, that we try to get at our young people before preconception. So those things, um, those ways that we treat each other and the children that we have care of can be one place where we intervene. How we um, look at our own lives, how we look at our professional lives, and how we treat clients can make all the difference. How we treat our coworkers can make a difference in how our day goes and how we perform. So that is what became the basis of our most recent um, summit that we're going to be conducting here, uh, sponsored by St. Richard's Mohawk Tribe. First year, we talked strictly about child abuse, physical um, child abuse. Last year, um, the summit was about human trafficking and um, exploitation, which um, both of those summits were very well attended. Over 250 people attended both summits. This year, we're going to be doing it um, from the basis of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And we're going to be really fortunate in having Dr. Robert Anda, who's the co-principal investigator of the study from the CDC, is going to be presenting in the morning. We're um, 
also going to be having numerous other um, presenters around, okay, so now that you know about what adverse experiences can do to a person, think about what that can do to an entire family and what it can do to an entire community because we are all the same. The community is just a bigger version of what happens to one little child who's not had the best upbringing. So we know that healing needs to happen and we know that the community can do it and we know that tribal council needs to support that and not be a barrier to people getting better. Well, that's it for the program. We hope you enjoyed the first episode and we say Nyawagoa. Until next time, Onigiwahe.